Welcome everyone, I'm Ivy Rivera, I'm a psychic medium and a Taino Airwalk. I own a school called the Ivy League Psychic Academy. Tonight, we are talking about spirit guides and angels. Now, what I love about this free mini class is that it's a combination of two full courses that I offer up on my website. One is called Meet Your Guides. The other one is called Coffee with Your Angels. And these are my two top bestsellers internationally. People love these classes because this is something so intimate that you're going to use for the rest of your life. Also, I love teaching these two particular classes because I've always found it such an unfortunate state that people confuse what spirits are trying to communicate with them. They confuse what the messages are and we often get to the wrong spirits and that's really deteriorating for the relationships. We often want to credit everything back to our ancestors or our deceased loved ones. And we don't realize that the majority of communication is coming from our guides or our angels. And we really need to start also um, utilizing our invisible network, our team that was assigned and appointed to us before we came to earth. The other thing that spirits really put upon my heart over the years is that so many people are struggling through life because they don't understand that they have this support network over here for them. And so they think it's sort of an airy fairy idea, or they've been taught through religious trainings that they have to maybe go to church to get that, or that that's something negative or demonic, or that it's out of bounds some that mediumship is a gift and that's just so unfortunate okay so we're going to do some myth busting here today and we are going to get you in touch with your guides and angels so i want to start straight away with some of the key differences between the two you have five guides appointed to you before you come to earth so when you sign that life contract you fill out your contract stating who you're going to be working with in this life, jobs that you need to do, lessons that you're going to have to learn, past life stuff you have to finish and incorporate. When you sign that contract, your guides are on your side, making sure that they understand everything that's in it and they understand the deadlines in that contract. Everything in life is on a deadline. That's why sometimes you feel the pressure and the squeeze. Usually when we're receiving guidance from the universe, we're receiving it from our guides who are trying to get you on contract, on path and on deadline with what you agreed to. Five guides come with you. In a minute, we're gonna break down who they are and how they communicate. You get two angels. So this is a really big difference. Five guides, two angels. The angels are there when you need them, but are far less common for the average person to be coming in contact with. So that's a huge misunderstanding that our angels are like our buddies, our friends, and they're constantly communicating. That's not what's going on. Another major difference between the two is that when you work for them, usually when you're sleeping, see my dreams class to learn more about this. But when you're sleeping, many of us work with the guides, helping to heal the world, preventing horrible scenarios from occurring, or we work for the angels. We're basically sent out to complete tasks. If you've ever woken up and you have a weird oil on your face, I call this the anointing oil, that may have come from working for angels. But that's a huge difference than working with the guides. So we have certain dreams where we are busy, busy, busy all night long. You wake up and you're tired. You're like, there's no way I slept eight hours and I'm this tired. What the heck was I doing? And you may have a sense of struggle while you're sleeping like that. Like you're trying repeatedly to accomplish some task. These dreams are fairly elusive. Again, see the dreams class to learn techniques to recover them but they tend to be lost from your memory. Very hard to trace, and they're not like ordinary sleep patterns or dreams. But the major difference there is that when we work with guides, we tend to see a lot of round table activity. It's like a meeting. You may be working not only with your own guides, but with other people's guides, members of your soul tribe, 
or if we're trying to fix something like a terrible world event, we could all be there working collectively together like a big think tank versus working for angels where they essentially assign you out to do things and you just sort of work yourself often really to the bone trying to get the task done. It's not so much of a community effort. We also see a major difference in the understanding of who our guides and angels are. Our guides are typically people or they may have always been guides, but they are trying to accomplish certain tasks. They are essentially finishing work that needs to be done. And if it is a human assigned to you as a guide, we would often see that that's almost like a karmic debt. It's a lesson that they need to learn. It's something that they didn't finish here on earth. They're obligated to you in some way versus angels who are the highest entities for healing in the universe. There's a hierarchy going on here. So if we were to say that humans are sort of down here on the hierarchy, and then we would have guides above us, and we would have angels above them, and then we would have like God energy above that, that would not be inaccurate. There is a huge difference in who angels are made up of and who guides are made up of. Guides can be, again, a couple different types of spirits, humans, guides. But when we look at angels, they were always that. They are the healing entities of the universe and are at the top of that hierarchy. Another big difference is their ability to be elusive. The angels come in and out. They often put you in a trance-like state so that you have no memory whatsoever of the encounter. They also like to come when you're asleep or you're in a deep state of meditation, put you in this trance-like state, whether it be for download purposes. I just put up some videos on downloads. You guys can also check out a class here called Receiving the Download in the playlist here on YouTube at Ask Ivy. But when they come, it's a secretive type of an encounter. When your guides come though, it's pretty casual. It's really every day. It's louder. There's not the same sense of boundaries there. Your guides would even, if you're meditating or you're trying to relax, you're sleeping, they might get really right up in your face trying to let you know what it is that they're saying. So it's a different different way of interacting. And the last one that I want to mention, there are a million more, but we're not going to have time to get to all that here for a mini class, is the difference in the actual way they communicate. When I train my psychic mediumship students in the Claire's, we're talking about different intuitive intelligences that you may have. Clairvoyance, Claire Augustine, Claire Cognizance, Claire Empathy, Claire Sentience. What do all these things mean? Learn more about the Claire's, check out the mini class. But what we're talking about with angels is Claire cognizance, which comes to the individual in, again, a trance-like state. It cannot be defined by any other Claire. By definition, we think of Claire cognizance as being gift bestowed upon the person. It is something that only people who are truly living a life of service have. So it's not really common to see people with Claire cognizant ability, but when an angel communicates, everybody has clear cognizance. That is the only way that they communicate. So you go into this state, sort of like a light switch. It's almost like you turn off and the knowledge and wisdom, the healing that they give you is on full blast. Now you come out of it and you typically feel better. You feel warmth, you feel peace. It's a lasting peace. It's an incredible healing energy. And it's the ability also to understand things. Claire cognizance at its core as a way of communication is about understanding the past, the present, and the future simultaneously. It's about understanding everyone and every factor involved in a situation, clearly. Now, guides, on the other hand, they tend to use clear audience. Clear audience will come to people typically with a tinnitus or a ringing in the ears, like an annoying vibration. It can also come as a feeling of pressure in the ears, like when an airplane goes up or comes down, or like a seashell. Clear audience is the ability to hear in your head a spirit 
as though it is your own thought. Most people who have clear audience don't realize that's what it is. So guides come through. They like to use clear audience. They like to put thoughts in your head. They are giving you guidance. Typically when we see clear audience kick in, we may also see things like an anxiety attack, perfusive sweating. They also like to communicate through clairvoyance because this is just something everybody has. That's just psychic ability. Everyone's a psychic. Everyone's a medium too. That's a class for another day. But clairvoyance is sort of the easiest clair, the lowest level of intuitive intelligence that we have. And it is sort of like communication 101. It is to keep you alive. It's your gut instinct. It's that voice inside that tells you switch out of this lane of traffic and get all the way over to the left and then a car accident happens on the right or don't take that street today whatever it is so they use your clairvoyant abilities to put visions in your mind's eye they use it when you're sleeping to give you dreams and symbology to let you know what it is that you're supposed to do in your life next or how to not make a mistake, or who to get rid of. Now, a lot of that comes along with symbology. So that can mean that colors, numbers, random images of things pop in your head, and you need to learn your symbology. Join us for the Psychic Mediumship course, get a good dream book, start Googling symbols. What are your guides trying to tell you? All right, let's talk about some of the myths. Most common myths that I see and hear on the daily about guides and angels are, ha ha ha, my guides and angels hate me. They must be drunk. They've abandoned me. Uh ha ha. And if I ever say like, and why would that be? Well, because I never listen to them. That's not really funny. Like you want to live, you want to finish with the work you came here to do. That's not the way to handle the wisest entities of the universe that were assigned to help you complete this life task. That is also not true. It is a myth that they don't they may not appreciate your behavior much, but they're not going to abandon you. And a lot of people will insist that they actually don't have guides. My guides won't talk to me and I just don't have any. That's not a thing. Every human being that's born to earth has the same amount. So it's not like some people are lucky and some people aren't. The thing is some people listen and some people don't. You have these guides who are there for you, but they also have to abide by what I call the law of the light. That means that helpful spirits from the light who are assigned to encourage you to get done what is within your life contract are able to let you know three different times what it is that you have to do. After that, due to the law of the light, they have to pull their energy back. Now they didn't abandon you, but they're not gonna keep telling you. That is the equivalent of enabling. That is the equivalent of them crossing a boundary or they have to stay in their lane, let's say. Now it's the same thing that you would see with like a parent to child dynamic or a teacher with a student. We are supposed to let our kids know, this is the rule, this is what you need to abide by, and if they don't do that, maybe you give them a reminder, but come the third time, there's going to be a penalty. Now, your guides and your angels aren't trying to punish you. You are essentially punishing yourself. And when we don't have follow through with a child, that child runs amok and ends up having to fall on their face and learn the hard way. Okay, same thing for a student at school. Teachers, you've got guidelines. It is what it is. You can only do so much. It's like saying you can lead a horse to water and your guides will abide by that law. So if you should feel like they have cut you off, sincerely you feel that, it's probably because there's something you didn't do. You refuse to listen to something you intuitively are well aware needed to be done. It's the same thing with the angels. All right, second most common myth that I hear is that our loved ones pass away, or if a baby or a child passes away, they earn their wings and halo and they go and they become an angel. No angel was ever human, that's the truth, and it can't be earned as a position. It's not going to happen 
that someone in your circle passes away and they all of a sudden are in the long white dress with the wings and they're there taking care of you. They have become your guardian angel. Absolutely not. And they don't also, even when people think that they see that happening, remember your imagination plays a big part in this, but angels also don't look like that. So that's another huge myth connected to this is that they have the long white dress and the wings. That's something I believe we've constructed. And your angel may appear to you that way because it's more comfortable for you. That will help you to build a bond with them. And they're more than happy to do that. But really what angels look like are long tubular light beings, long tubular arms, long tubular legs. It could even look like one piece. They really don't have a face. They are very, very bright. When they come, the whole room may light up. You may be the only one to see that light. A lot of people confuse them for alien encounters. All right, let's look at another myth here. Oh, all my guides are natives. No, they're not. All my guides are natives. All these depictions, right? I'm guilty even when I have to make an ad on social media, all I can find are native guides. And I'm like, it's a good thing I'm native, but like, that's not a thing. So all my guides are native. My guides are guardian angels of the universe, or my guides are major figureheads, like big, huge players, right, in the world. That's typically not happening. I'm not saying it can't happen, but people like to, again, with the imagination, make it out to be more than what it is because they want to believe that they come to Earth with huge purpose compared to the average person. So that's that's more ego than anything. Why are guides depicted so often as being native? I guess it's been a money-making tool. More people want to identify as being native. The minute we start talking about spirituality and we get away from religious dogma and restrictions of that whole scene, we automatically go to natives because we don't know anything else. And so people who maybe also aren't native want to identify as being native. And if they can be told by a psychic or a medium that all their guides are native, it'll make them feel more so like part of the team. The reality is we're all part of the team. You don't need to have five native guides for absolutely no reason. However, if you are native, it is more common to see that there and we may have them. But the reality is that most guides are like Tom down the street who passed away and didn't finish all his work and now has to help others to complete their life tasks. And he is assigned to you. And that can be the end of the story. Guides are also sometimes always been guides. There is no human element there. And so the whole native thing is a human construct. So it doesn't fit there either. Can your guides be angels? No. Why would we do that? You have two angels and you have five guides. So sometimes I'll have a student who insists, that's my angel, that's my angel. You were probably communicating with your angel. It doesn't make your angel a guide. And there would be no purpose for one of your guides to have to be some big archangel in the universe. Okay, again, that's ego. The idea that there's some big figurehead. A lot of people love this idea. If we do see major power players in the universe, it is usually that they have, just like angels, people working under them. And it is possible that you're working with a guide that would be under them. But to go right to the top, 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 and have that as your guide is not the most common thing to see. Here's another myth. Angels have names. My angel came to me and told me their name. Well, names are something that we give them. Angels do not have ego. Angels don't have a sense of identity that way. That, again, is a human construct. So that's something that you may have come up with yourself using your imagination. And they're encouraging it because it helps the bond between the two of you to be made and to grow. Another myth, I get feathers and numbers all the time and they're coming from my angels or they're coming from my guides. We don't want to over categorize that. What we need to understand about numbers and see our numerology class to learn more about that is that that's not exclusively an angel thing. I don't know when that started. Angels do use them, but so does everybody else. Okay, the same thing with feathers. That's not exclusively an angel 
real thing. Guides use feathers. Your ancestors, your loved ones will use feathers. Your dog may even use feathers and numbers to communicate with you. So we definitely don't want to categorize that as being exclusively with them. Okay, then another common myth. My angel is Archangel so-and-so. Okay, my angel is Archangel Michael. Archangel Michael talks to me all day long. I'm interacting with him. You can be appointed to an Archangel, but that's not going to be one of your two appointed angels. Again, there's a hierarchy. So we have angels that are quite high up, like these Archangels who we've named. And then we have angels that work under them. You would be given one of those lower level angels. Is it possible though to be assigned to, for example, Archangel Michael, it is. And it would be work that you came to earth to do. We would say that you came to earth with a healer contract or a light worker contract, and it would show up in your Vedic or Western astrology. So check it out. Absolutely, we can track these things. For example, those who work for Archangel Michael are here to fight a war. They are here to fight a battle and break down fear and restrictions and get people out from under the boot to help them get free of their chains. Archangel Michael is about revolution, okay? So if you're a real couch potato and you want to insist every day that Archangel Michael is your guy, it's probably not the case. Hey, that's a big work contract to work under him. All right, so let's look at another one. We have a casual friendship with angels. There has been... Over-identification with this, especially in recent years where people want to say that they're a healer and they've got the angel wings coming out of them and they've got all these references to how they're so close with the angels and every time they do a card reading or something like this, they're channeling them. We need to remember that there should be reference there and that they're very elusive and they come with huge purpose. They aren't our buds, our friends, and you may want to be cautious buying into those comments. Concepts. We really shouldn't identify me as a healer. I've never once put angel wings on myself or over identified as being an angel or, and I am appointed to St. Michael. I think it's inappropriate to act like these are such casual friendships and relationships. Okay. It's an honor to even be called to work for them at all. It is never going to come up in super simple passing terms. However, it is possible that you are communicating with something else. A lot of people don't know the difference, again, between communicating with their ancestors, their loved ones, spirits that are earthbound, angels, guides, animals, elementals. They just don't know the difference. We don't want to assume that it's an angel first thing. That's probably really unlikely. But I did want to get into who are our guides and who are our angels. Okay, so let's talk about your five guides. Who are your guides? Okay, so number one, you have a joy guide. Your joy guide is your spiritual development guide. Your joy guide watches over your mental and emotional well-being. This is your right-hand man or woman. This was your imaginary friend when you were a child. This was probably the stuffed animal or the blanket you dragged around. That energy in that blanket before it became your imaginary friend. Your joy guide is the one who's really going to be communicating with you 24-7. And when you have a problem, a question, just go directly to that one. We have your relationship guide next. Your relationship guide watches over all of your relationships, your communication, but also in regards to your business, your money, things like this. They may be helping you there as well. And it's not uncommon to see your relationship guide network with your work and money guide, who we'll talk about next. Especially if you're like a business owner or you're into like activism, things like this. Your work guide is also your money guide. Now, this one gets confused a lot for being all about that paycheck, all about that work promotion, all about that career. And that's only part of it. Yes, your work and money guide wants to see you eat and pay your mortgage, but they are also focused uh, above and beyond on the life contract that you signed on to. So it's the work that you came to earth to do. That is always their ultimate goal to get you on path with that. And sometimes it can look like your work and money guide has abandoned you because they're not helping you with money as much as you would like to see. Could be a sign that you're off path. Then we have a protector guide. That's number four. Your protector guide does what it sounds like. This one is overseeing accidents, illnesses, toxic relationships, giving you warnings, keeping you safe. You also have number five, an Akashic. Akashic Record Guide 
holds all of your past life information. And as you have past lives that come to the forefront, we just did a free mini class called Past Life Trauma. Okay, here on the playlist, you may want to check it out. When you have a past life that's coming to the surface so that you can get some work done, resolve some hard relationships, learn some lessons, your Akashic record guide is going to be stepping up more into your life. And then you would watch them sort of step back. And then when it, if it happens again, you'll feel more from that one. So Akashic is typically going to show up in dreams. Pay attention for that. Now, if you guys want to meet your guides, I have a class called Meet Your Guides up on the website where I introduce you through a series of exercises to each one of them individually, and I get far more in-depth on who they are and how they communicate. And some people may have extras. Some people who came here with a healer contract or a light-working contract to Earth may have a healer guide, but that guide may not show up until that individual has done a lot of shadow work, has done a lot of self-healing, and is ready to start healing others. So that one can sort of come out of nowhere, it may seem. And we can have temporaries, which means, for example, if you go through huge change, say you're getting a divorce, and that's going to affect your custody arrangements with your kids, it's going to affect your finances, it's going to affect your residency. If that is a lot of change in life to all happen at once. You may end up with a temporary guide to see you through that process. We typically see temporaries show up and they stick around for like maybe two years, and then they sort of disappear. Who are our angels? Okay, to learn more about your angels in depth and to meet each one of your angels individually through a series of exercises, you're going to want to check out the coffee with your angels class. But for today, we're going to talk about these two. You have a guardian angel appointed to you and a protector angel. You get two. Now the guardian angel is watching over, similar to your joy guide, your mental and emotional well-being. But should you be going through any significant amount of distress, again, like a divorce that's going to affect many areas of your life, your guardian angel will come in closer and keep an eye on you more frequently. They are trying to make sure that you are emotionally and mentally as stable as you can be and trying to make sure that you're safe through processes like that. If you suffered any kind of tremendous loss to like loss of a loved one, death, things like this, uh, severe illnesses, you would see them coming closer and often they don't go back to the way that they were, meaning they don't get as distant ever again as they once had been. You may be able to feel that guardian angel in closer to you than what you previously had and that'll last the rest of your life. Now we also have a protector angel. Your protector is watching over your health, your relationships so that you're safe and any kind of potential pitfalls or accidents you might get yourself into. A great example that I see all the time is that someone's going in for some kind of a surgery and their protector angel will be there at the foot of the bed, guiding the nurses, the aides, the doctors, saving off infection, around the clock, your protector may show up for that. I wanna talk um, about a couple simple exercises that you guys can do for homework to get more in touch with your angels and guides. Exercise number one, invite each one of your guides separately to come and spend time with you in your dreams. Give each guide about one week. So before you go to bed, you want to say, joy guide, I would love to meet you. I wanna to get to know you more. I want to know what you look like or how I can more easily identify your energy, how you communicate, do you sign symbols? What is this guide's interaction with you that you've been overlooking? You want to know more about that. So you just ask. And I would consistently give one week to that guide and then move on to your relationship and your work and so-and-so down the line. Number two, I would sit for about 10 minutes maybe twice a week and thank your angel. Angels are all about healing. Angels are all about gratitude. They're about that high level energy. So a great way to get in touch with your angels is to thank them for everything that they've done for you. You may also want to ask, could you show me any parts of my life where I may need to do some healing? And you should also ask how you can be of service in the world around you. Thank your angel and then ask them to show you people crossing your path throughout that day when you can be there to give back to the light in the universe. 
that will strengthen the bond. Number three, I do this every morning and I tell my students in the very first day of psychic mediumship class, you need to do this as part of your lifestyle. This should never end. Sit for about 10 minutes with your morning cup of coffee with your guides. Turn the phone off, put on some nice meditation music and ask your guides three things. Please show me what I should be focused on today. Show me if there are any pitfalls that I can avoid or anything that might cost me prosperity and how can I be of service in the world? Okay, and they'll show you exactly what's gonna happen for the day. Nothing should be able to blindside you ever again. That builds the bond really, really quickly. I do want to get to some of the members questions. So if you become a member, you will have an opportunity to post what you want to see added into the curriculum for all the free mini classes. So Shelby says, is there a specific way that is personal between me and my spirit guides that would help me connect with them? Well, there you go, Shelby, I beat you to it. Okay, the three tips that I just showed you there. Again, if you want to really connect with them and have me lead you through the exercises, the one class is called Coffee with Your Angels. And the other one is called Meet Your Guides. They're up on the website. And then we have from Bernadette. I listen to my guides at least three to four times a week, sitting in the quiet, staying open. I believe I have guides and angels that communicate using numbers. They also like to use my phone and clocks. Do guides and angels influence the people who come into our lives? There are no coincidences. People show up, I can't figure out why. Are the guides and angels directing that? Do they set it up? No. Do they influence the people who come into our lives? No, you did that. So before you come to earth, you sign that life contract and a huge part of that life contract for some people is the relationships that you're going to have. And so you have chosen who you're going to encounter. They are either there to help you build to teach you lessons, right? Or maybe you're there to assist them in some way. You guys have a karmic contract. You have business to do together. We pick our soulmates that way. And we have everyone else in the universe, angels, guides, ancestors, playing along with what we signed on to. So no, they're not influencing it. They will influence you though, if you're like overlooking it. They're like, hey, hey, you're supposed to be dealing with this person. Give this person more time and attention. Or this is good. Network with this individual. Or they'll be like, run Okay, get away from that person that is that has nothing to do with you. This is bad news. So that way, yes. And then we had one more here from Alex. I don't really see my guides. I see shadows with color. Okay, that's good. That's perfect. Except for two of them. My joy guide was my imaginary friend. There you go. That's super common. I love that. I still see color with her. Well, one of the things that you might be really good at, Alex, is to get into the mediumship training and understand that colors are messages. You may also be good at getting into something like orograph reading, which I also train you in, in the psychic mediumship course, or Reiki, where you're dealing with chakras. There's a big difference between angel colors that float around us as orbs, colors that are in the body as chakras, and aura colors that come out. Colors are a little complicated, and there's a lot there. There's nothing wrong with the way that you're seeing them. You seem to know that. I think if you can get something as significant as colors, you don't really need all the other stuff. So that's really important. Figure out what they are telling you. I see some that have have hats. The hats are moods. The protector is red. The relationship is green. Akashic is light blue. Okay, again, with the colors. The hat is also symbolic of protection on your crown and protection on your third eye. So I absolutely love that your guides are using that with you. They're basically showing you by them wearing it what they're doing for you. I'm not surprised the protector would come through with a red hat because that is your power. That is your prosperity. That is also your protection. And so to put that over your crown is a big deal. So there's a ton of symbology in that also. You're getting both. Excellent. I love that. Well, the ear ringing and the vibrating can come in for a lot of reasons. Check out my free mini class here on YouTube at Ask Ivy called My Ears Are Ringing. It's in the playlist to break it down. It can happen because you're a level three, four empath. It can happen because there's paranormal activity. It can happen like the grandmothers used to say, left for love and right for spite because you 
you either have mediumship kicking in or your psychic ability is kicking in. It can happen before you do astro travel at night. There are a lot of reasons you may hear the ringing. We don't want to automatically assume that it's a guide coming in trying to give us guidance because then your imagination can sort of get away without you. And we don't want to try to force messaging. If that is in fact the case, the message should be pretty obvious. So sit still, give it 10 minutes with a paper and a notepad and see what signs they're showing you. If there's nothing there, it's something else. You got to learn your body. You have to learn how your clairs work. There are all kinds of angels. And I try not to get into categories because humans made those categories. So that's not a real thing. Like even just trying to specify, there are healing entities in the universe. They will work in a hierarchy for sure. If they have names, that is because humans gave them names. Angels are going to work with two other energies in the universe typically, or at least on the earth plane, we think of it this way. That's animals and empaths. And so I say there's a triad and we would see a lot of networking going on there. Yes, anything is possible. And I would just shed all the old labels. Well, they could, but it depends on what kind of angel it is. So often angels will come through as a cascading twinkling light, almost like a waterfall. If you've ever on the 4th of July, right? You ever see a firework that falls? It's like that. They could also come through as like flashes of lights. But when we're talking about the orbs, we can usually tell a lot by what angel angel is around based on the color of the orb. So yes, it could be, but the deceased could also come through as orbs. In the Coffee with Your Angels class, I break down every color of orb and what archangels it might be connected to. It could be. It could be your higher mind giving you messages, meaning you're doing it to yourself to help yourself along your life journey. Pay attention to the messages that those numbers would represent. Giving your own self-direction. It could be your guides. It could be your ancestors. It could be your loved ones. Anybody can use the numbers. Absolutely. It could be. Usually we hear the voices and music and things like this. We start to have visuals of other people or spirits in the room, usually when the veil gets lifted. So as we're dozing off and we're waking up and the veil is lifted, we start to see and experience here things that were all always there, but we were tuning it out. Now we've shifted to the right side of our brain and we're relaxed and we're able to hear and see clearly. I would not necessarily assume that all that ruckus is a guide. Guides tend to be very specific in their communication and they're pretty hard to ignore. So that could just be background noise, but I would definitely ask them when you notice it next time and check and see. If you have trouble because you're dozing off, use lucid dreaming techniques that I train you in, check out my class called Dreams up on the website. Yes, and what you may have noticed was a lot of green also following you around. Raphael is the archangel associated with helping people to heal. So that makes perfect sense that Raphael would have been there during your healing process and then would have also tried to help you to convert what you learned to be able to help others. So Raphael may kind of go and then you would see a reappearance of that when you're ready to gift out that same information to others to help heal them. So absolutely, that makes beautiful sense very heartwarming because a lot of people explain them the same way. And you know that that was a true angel encounter. And we don't want to dismiss the wings and the dress because again, these are constructs that help us to feel comfortable and connected with them. And that's what they want. That's all they care about. They don't have ego, but in the raw form that they are often confused for aliens. And a lot of people think that they had an alien encounter because when an angel comes in often at night, again, like I said, the whole room lights up. So it's easy to think that like a UFO landed in your front lawn and then like the lights up, and then you got this long tubular creature or a few of them. It happens all the time. You should. So everything that we do here at the Academy is the opposite of the old school method still being taught internationally today based on pacifism. So what we do is we are actively engaging and asking. Yes, ask for more. No, but you can be blocked. God isn't going to assign a dud to you. Like my angel's broken, my guide's dysfunctional. That doesn't happen. But if you have blocks, you need to figure out where they came from. And typically with shadow work, we have a free mini class up on that in a three-part church series here on the Roots Revival on shadow work. We are able to more clearly hear from our ancestors, our angels and guides 
tune into the right side of our intuitive brain when we remove those blocks. So it's going to flow a ton, like Pandora's box, just like a ton will flow into you once that block is removed. Typically it's due to trauma. I don't really see that happening very much. I really feel like everything is very separate in this. You'll notice it right down to the dreams that you have where you work for them or when they come in to assist you with something. It's sort of like... I think of the Catholic system. So in the Catholic system, it was funny. I heard a comedian talking on this the other day. He said, you know, you don't just go right to God if you're a Catholic. They're outrageous. Like, that's so rude. You have angels appointed to you. You have saints above that. And you've got, everyone has their own category and their own place. And you know who to go to for different things. I thought, that's hilarious. That's like pretty accurate, right? So no, we don't tend to see sort of a hodgepodge or all of them working collectively in their own way. You could say that it all works as one whole system for sure. And it's very, very efficient when we use it properly, but not so much. So your guides are taking care of certain things. Your angels are taking care of other, far more dangerous things, I guess we could say. And the only times I've really noticed that I see a whole collection, and it's not even just them, it's also like your ancestors, your loved ones, is during the death process. And if there's any kind of really tragic situation, like a horrible car accident, they may all be there at once, or if something's about to happen, you can actually hear them, like I heard, heard once my guides debating, two of them debating with each other, trying to figure out how they were going to instruct me. And I felt the presence of my angels there at the same time. So as something is maybe about to occur, yeah, but typically no, not on a Tuesday. Yes. Earlier I spoke about, and I talk about this in the Meet Your Guides class more in depth, how we work with each other's guides, but that doesn't have to be a super meaningful relationship either. It doesn't have to be like that only happens with your soulmates. It can be anyone that you're working with in this life at any given time. So they absolutely help each other and you may hear directly from. And as a medium and the way I train my students, they're trained to sit there and talk to those guides. So absolutely, we do this every day. I don't honestly feel like that's true. I think that what a lot of readers do is to say something that you would be really receptive to and it's not based in any kind of truth the reality is that your grandmother watches over you which could feel very much like a guide and i do feel that your grandmother is invested in your life in certain key areas which means you guys have a work contract so she will continue to work with you in those areas i don't think she should be confused for one of the five guides actually appointed to you in life so i hope that this helped a lot again coffee with your angels meet your guides two full classes up on the website okay thank you so much polly Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Spirit. Have a great night.